My office is just here. Um, if you got this door, turn a right. Uh, I have an office here. I think some people are still surprised that I have an office here. Some have never visited. Uh, please come on by. Stop on by. I've got, it's the last uh, door. So basically, uh, you got to make it through the gauntlet. And if you can make it past, your, past Pastor Jesse, past the secretary, past Pastor Elisha, uh, then the last door on the right, you will find uh, me uh, very diligently studying in there. And if you go into my office, you'll see uh, behind me all of these books uh, that I've read, uh, front to back, some just the front, just the back. And on that bookshelf, uh, I have a bunch of bobbleheads, right? And so, oh, I feel like it's show and tell for me again. Okay, okay. So uh, I just brought a few. So this is uh, Batman. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I got Batman bobblehead, I have Iron Man bobblehead, I have some Stormtrooper bobbleheads, uh, I even have a uh, John the Baptist bobblehead. They, they, they make John the Baptist. You can see um, he has a jar of honey, and uh, I think there's some locusts there by his feet. Um, thankfully, he's clothed, but we even have a John the Baptist uh, bobblehead, right? Uh, and so I really enjoy collecting these bobbleheads from time to time. If I go to Dave and Buster's, I'll save up my points and I'll go and get a bobblehead, right? Uh, I like kind of like the, the cartoon, the, the character that they make, and of course, uh, who doesn't like a nice uh, bobbling, jiggling head? Some good decoration. I even have a Sean Marion bobblehead someone gave me, um, different bobblehead. But what if I told you that these bobbleheads in my office, I didn't just keep them up there for decoration, right? What if I told you I didn't just have these bobbleheads because from time to time, when I really need to think, I bobble their heads, right? What if I told you that I have these bobbleheads in the back of my office because it's my shrine? That these bobbleheads are not just decorative figures, but in fact, I worship these bobbleheads, right? In fact, if you come and visit me and you pass through the gauntlet of the offices, you get past the secretary, past Pastor Jesse, past Pastor Elisha. If you come in and you don't knock, you might find me bowing down and praying to Batman, John the Baptist, Sean Marion, Iron Man, right? And what, what if I told you during the week, I pray to Batman, Bruce Wayne, Bruce, I want to be rich like you, Bruce. Right? I pray to Iron Man, Tony Stark. I want to be a genius. Make me smarter. Right? I, mean, I pray to Sean Marion. Sean Marion, I want to be better at basketball. Right? And you guys are probably thinking it's not going to work. It's Sean Marion. I, maybe I, I pray to, to John the Baptist. And, and when I'm preparing a lesson, I'm thinking I need to be bold like him. And so I bow down on my knees and I pray to John the Baptist. John the Baptist, please bobblehead John the Baptist. Please. Give me the word to speak, right? What if I said this morning, the worship is going to come back up, and we're going to sing songs, we're going to dim the light from the cross, and now we're going to sing these praise songs to Batman and John the Baptist. Right? What if I said, from this day forth, on Sunday and each and every day, you all will get your own bobblehead, and you will now worship your very own bobblehead. You'll get to pray to your bobblehead. You'll get to bow down to your bobblehead. You can find ways to sacrifice to your bobblehead. But thank goodness this. I think it's safe to say that we would all be uncomfortable with worshiping bobbleheads. I think it's a good thing. I think it's safe to say we would be all opposed. We would all reject Committing idolatry by worshiping bobbleheads. To commit idolatry, uh, meaning to worship, to place priority, anything before God. To make anything more important than God. I think it's safe to say that we would be opposed to committing idolatry by worshiping bobbleheads. That's the good part. But I think the part that concern is we will be opposed to worshiping or committing idolatry by worshiping bobbleheads. And the part of that phrase that we would oppose is the with bobbleheads part. Do we oppose committing idolatry or are we opposed with committing idolatry with bobbleheads? 
Now, now sure, living here in, in the West in America, we're more opposed to worshiping statues, bowing down to figurines, to shrines, worshiping bobbleheads. But when I think about myself, if anything, how often I commit idolatry by worshiping the biggest bobblehead I know. This head bobbles, okay? Myself. Uh, sure, going to Taiwan, you look in the houses and there's all these shrines, there's all these idols. You, you go to the store, you go to the market, you go to a restaurant, maybe even here, and you can see an idol. And maybe I tell myself, you know, there's no way that I'm going to build a shrine inside of my house. But you know, oftentimes it's too late already. I don't need to build a shrine inside my house. My house is a shrine in and of itself. I don't need to build a shrine inside my house to worship myself. My shrine is the house itself that bears witness to worship me. My house is my castle. My house has all my possessions. My house tells others all that I have possessed and acquired in this world. We would be opposed to committing idolatry by bowing down to these bobbleheads, but be careful how often Do we commit idolatry by worshiping the biggest bobbleheads that we know? Ourselves. How many times that even in the name of religion, even in the name of worshiping God, are we in fact worshiping ourselves? How many times in the name of serving God are we in fact serving ourselves? How often in the name of praying and worshiping to God are we in fact praying and worshiping ourselves? ourselves. This morning, we're going to see two things, two red flags. What are two red flags that we need to be aware and to be careful of to help us recognize when we are not worshiping God any longer, but in fact, we're worshiping and serving ourselves. Two red flags this morning to help us identify when we are committing idolatry by worshiping the biggest Bible heads that we know you and I. This morning, if you would please turn with your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 5. This morning, we're going to be in God's Word in 1 Samuel chapter 5. You can find 1 Samuel navigating it in the Old Testament towards the left-hand side of your Bibles, starting with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, keep going. Joshua, Judges, Ruth, then 1 and 2 Samuel. If you saw Proverbs, if you see Malachi, if you go into the New Testament, you've gone too far. In the Old Testament, towards the left-hand side of your Bibles, 1 Samuel, and today we'll be in chapter 5. For the past few weeks, we've been moving on through 1 Samuel, and we'll be moving on through 1 Samuel up until the end of 2016. As we anticipate and look forward and remember Christ coming as our Savior, and we anticipate his return as our coming king, we'll look at Israel's journey as they seek a king for themselves. Here in chapter 5, the first few chapters of 1 Samuel, uh, we're 300 years removed from the exodus out of Egypt. It's been 300 years since Moses took God's people, Israel, out of Egypt And now they've already moved into the promised land, the land of Canaan. It's about 100 years before David takes the throne. Israel has taken over territories, taken over cities within the land of Canaan. We've been introduced, for the most part, to the city of Shiloh, uh, the northern part of Israel. And it's here that the Ark of the Covenant of God resides, and it's here the tabernacle, and it's here the high priest Eli, his sons Hophni and Phinehas, lead people in the worship of God. Uh, But in chapter 2, we find out that they are wicked men. They do not know the Lord. They are committing sins and leading people away from God. And so in chapter 2 and chapter 3, there's prophecy being spoken against Israel, against the priests, that God is going to punish them. In chapter 4, Samuel receives the word from the Lord. Sorry, in chapter 3. And then chapter 4, as we saw last week, God's people take the Ark of the Covenant to fight against the Philistines. We saw that the Philistines, 
they were already moved and occupied the land of Canaan. They were already in the promised land about 2000 BC, a full thousand years before Israel comes into the land of Canaan. And as such, as Israel takes over the land of the Philistines, naturally there's going to be war, there's going to be tension, there's going to be conflict. And so in chapter 4, we saw a great battle. Israel goes into battle against the Philistines. They lose, losing 4,000 men. So they go back 25 miles to Shiloh. They grab the Ark of the Covenant along with the priests, Hophni and Phinehas, and they bring, again, battle against the Philistines, expecting victory from God. But what happens instead? They lose 30,000 men of Israel this time. The Ark of the Covenant is captured. Hophni and Phinehas, the priests, are killed. On the same day, Eli, the high priest, hears of this news that the Ark has been taken. He falls over in his chair, breaks his neck, and he dies. Israel is mourning the loss, loss of battle, loss of lives, loss of the ark, loss of the priests, loss of the relationship with God. Here we pick up in chapter 5. The Philistines have now taken the ark of the covenant, and let's look at what they do with it. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. When the Philistines captured the Ark of God, they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. The Philistines take the Ark of the Covenant and take it to a city called Ashdod and set it up in the temple of Dagon. Uh, so the next slide, uh, this map will help us kind of navigate through. Uh, and then one more. Okay. Uh, So we're going to go through a lot of cities today in chapter 5. So we see there at the very top, Shiloh. That is where the Ark of the Covenant begins. It's taken 50 miles west to, uh, sorry, to to, to Aphek, to Ashdod, and there it resides. There in the temple of Dagon, Ark of the Covenant is held. Who then is Dagon? So we go back a slide, we'll see a picture of Dagon. The Philistines worshipped this idol, this statue. Dagon is their main and primary god. Dagon takes the form. He is half man, top torso man, bottom half is of a fish. So he's a merman or a mermaid uh, looking type thing. Right? And so this is Dagon. They created this God for themselves. And what do they expect of Dagon? His top half, the half of a man, because as they reside on land, they worship Dagon because they expect Dagon will give them good crops, good harvest of the land. And they worship Dagon because he's at the bottom of a fish. They expect that Dagon will give them good harvest of the sea. That they're going to have good crops on land and they're going to catch a lot of fish in the sea. And so they take the Ark of the Covenant and put it at the threshold of Dagon, presenting it as a gift, as a sign of victory over Israel, over God, and putting it before their God, Dagon, saying that Dagon is superior and greater than the God of the Hebrews. And then what is so significant about the Ark of the Covenant? Why had the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant? Why did Israel go and get the Ark of the Covenant to take it into battle with them? If you could get the next slide, a picture of the Ark of uh, the Covenant. So the Ark of the Covenant is a wood box laden with gold. It's about four and a third feet long, about two and a half feet wide, two and a half feet deep. And this wood and gold box, God told Israel to make it. Inside the box are the Ten Commandments that were given to Moses. Inside the box is Aaron's staff. Inside the box is a gold jar of manna, preserved from when Israel was wandering in the wilderness. On top of the gold box is the mercy seat, that cap that goes on top of the Ark of the Covenant. As you see, again, made out of gold, you have two cherubim with their wings spread out facing one another. On the side of the Ark of the Covenant, there are rings and there are poles that are placed throughout the rings, and those poles are there so that they can transport the Ark of the Covenant safely. God tells them, do not touch the Ark of the Covenant, because if you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you will die. On top of the Ark of the Covenant is the mercy seat, and the significance of the mercy seat is this. 
God tells Israel to put the Ark of the Covenant inside the tabernacle, inside the Holy of Holies, so that once a year, God will come down in between the two cherubim to meet with the high priest to give his commands to Israel. The Ark of the Covenant represents the very presence of God with his people. Red flag number one. How can we tell when we are worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping God? How can we tell when we are worshiping ourselves instead of worshiping God? When we are worshiping God for our own gain. We can tell that we are no longer worshiping God and we are worshiping ourselves when we worship God for our own gain. The Philistines, how do we tell that they are worshiping themselves? In the name of worshiping Dagon, how do they tell we're worshiping themselves? Because they worship Dagon so that Dagon will give them what they want. For Israel, how can we tell Israel is worshiping God, but in fact they're worshiping themselves? They take the Ark of the Covenant and expect God to give them the victory that they want. They're worshiping God for their own gain. A proper relationship with God is this. God is our creator, and we are his creation. God's creation serves the creator. But when we co commit idolatry, we create something, and we hope that that creation worships us. We create worship. We create religion. We create our own prayer life. We create our own scripture reading. We create our own time with God. We create church. And we expect these things to serve us. But we have it backwards. Creation is not to be served by its creator, but we as creation are to serve God. We are to know that we are worshiping ourselves when we worship God for our own gain. So the first application this morning is this. Instead of marking the success of your relationship with God based on your worldly gain, instead of marking the success of your relationship with God based on your worldly gain, mark your success in your relationship with God based on how much you're able to surrender of your life. So instead of saying, man, that was a great time reading God's word. I feel really good about myself. Or man, that was really good prayer with God. It really worked because I got what I wanted. Instead of worshiping our God, worshiping ourselves through religion, what if we measured it instead based on how much we're able to surrender? Man, that was really effective prayer. God is real because now I can surrender all the idols I've been hanging on to. Man, God is real, and, and this reading scripture, this prayer life is really working, and I know that my relation with God is a success because I have peace about suffering for his name. I have peace about bearing witness to him. I have peace about the unknowns because I trust in him. The first red flag to know if we're worshiping ourselves instead of God is that when we worship God for our own gain. To keep from worshiping God for our own gain, measure the success of your relationship with God, not based on how much worldly gain you get out of your relationship with God, but instead measure the success of your relationship with God based on how much of your life you're able to give up and surrender to him. The second red flag we see in the rest of chapter 5. And when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. But when they rose early on the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen face downward to the ground before the ark of the Lord. And the head of Dagon and both his hands were laying cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. This is why the priests of Dagon and all who enter the house of Dagon do not tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. They bring the Ark of the Covenant into the temple of Ash, uh, Dagon. And, and there, what happens? 
God shows his supremacy. God shows his power. God knocks over the statue one time. They put it back up. Then the next morning, they come and find what happened. God not only knocked it over this time, but he cut off the head and the hands. He has struck fear in the Philistines. Moving forward, this is what God does next. The hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and afflicted them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territory. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon our God. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, what shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath, right? This thing's horrible. We can't handle it. Let's give it to our friends in the next city. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines. What shall we do with the ark of the Lord? They answered, let the ark of the God of Israel be brought around to Gath. So they brought the ark of the God of Israel there. But after they had brought it around, the hand of the Lord was against the city, causing a very great panic, and he afflicted the men of the city, both young and old, so that tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. But as soon as the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, They have brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people. They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own people, own place, that it may not kill us and our people. For there was a deathly panic throughout the whole city. The hand of God was heavy there. The men who did not die were struck with tumors and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Uh, so again, going back to the picture of the map, this will help us see just the extent of the damage that God causes. There in Ashdod, it takes down their god, Dagon. So God defeats the god of the Philistines, and they're struck with fear. They don't know what to do with the ark, and so they move it down to Gath. And once it goes down to Gath, then, as we also learn in chapter 6, not only tumors, but they're struck with the plagues of rats. Many people are sick and they die because of the Lord there. The people of Gath, they've had enough. And so we had enough. Move it to Ekron. And so then the Ark of the Covenant goes to Ekron. And there again, God spreads his judgment and wrath against the people. The people there die and those who don't die suffer the plagues and the tumors. In the Hebrew here, the word for the tumor tells us and it suggests to us the location of where these tumors are growing. The Hebrew word for this tumor tells us that the tumors are growing in the rectal area. Getting punished by God stinks. All right. Not pretty, not pleasant. God doesn't just strike down one city of the Philistines, not just two cities. He makes a world tour throughout the Philistine cities and wipes them out. They're struck with fear. They're struck with illness, sickness, and death. As I read chapter 5, what is the most glaring thing that happens? As I was reading chapter 5, I'm looking at God's strength and God's power. He knocks down the idol. He strikes them with tumors and plagues and he kills the Philistines. In chapter five, I'm struck by God's power, but all the more than I question and look at chapter four and I wonder at God's inactivity. If God is so powerful and so able in chapter 5 to strike down the Philistines, I don't know about you, but then I ask the question, wait, we just looked at chapter 4 last week. God, your people took the Ark of the Covenant. Why didn't you give rats and tumors and plagues and kill the Philistines then? Why did God only flex his power and his might after the Philistines had conquered and killed Israel. It doesn't make sense to me. 
If God is going to show his power and sovereignty, why doesn't he do it before Israel dies? The stark contrast between chapter 5 and chapter 4 is this. It's not that God was active in chapter 5 and not active in chapter 4. But the way that God is active in both chapter 5 and in chapter 4 show us that what is God's priority? God's priority is not Israel's victory. God's priority is not that Israel will win. God's priority is God's victory. God's priority is that God will win. Why do I expect God to deliver Israel? It's not Israel's priority that God wins. It's not God's priority that Israel wins. The priority still stands, praise God. God is both sovereign in chapter 4 when Israel is defeated, and God is still sovereign in chapter 5 when the Philistines are defeated. God shows his judgment, his sovereignty, his wrath upon the Philistines. How? By casting wraths, plagues, and death upon the Philistines. God shows his judgment and his wrath upon Israel. How? By casting upon Israel the Philistines. In both, God is sovereign and he shows his strength, his power, his might. But in this display with Israel, how do we see problem number two? What's a red flag that Israel is worshiping themselves instead of God? By grabbing the Ark of the Covenant, they show that they're worshiping themselves instead of God. How? When they forget to repent of their sins when they become so familiar and acquainted with God that they no longer think repentance is for themselves. Israel takes the Ark of the Covenant into battle thinking that God is going to strike down the wicked. And Israel is correct. The only thing is they fail to realize that the wicked are not just the Philistines, but the wicked are they themselves. We worship ourselves when we see all the wickedness around us and we worship God and we think to ourselves, man, God's just going to strike down and use his wrath on all these people, right? And fail to see the importance of repentance in our own lives. I remember I was uh, driving down uh, George Bush and uh, I was going to meet... um, uh, with, with, with another pastor in the district. And so I was going to George, George Bush, um, and as I was going down uh, the highway, uh, going to meet, uh, I noticed that there was a speed trap. Uh, so I was going eastbound, and I noticed that there was a westbound speed trap, right? Oh, and I, I love speed traps. There's always one down here on uh, Custer near Park. Uh, there used to be one always set up there, and what I would do is I would go get Uh, Like during lunch, I would go get maybe uh, a meal and then I would park maybe a street down from where the cop was because I would would, would just watch people get caught. It was a lot of fun. And and so uh, when I was going eastbound down George Bush, I noticed there's a speed trap coming back westbound. Oh, I had to meet with this. Oh, okay, I can't. Okay. Uh, So I went and met. Okay. Uh, We met for a little bit. And as we're coming back, I realized, wait. I'm going westbound now, and there's that speed trap. I'm getting really excited. I want to see someone get caught, right? I was going down westbound. I see this, 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 this car go fly down past me. And I'm thinking, yes, he's flying down towards the speed track. He's going to get caught, right? I want to see this. So I accelerate, all right? I pick up speed because I want to see this guy get caught, and I want to see justice get served. I'm following him. Sure enough, the cop is still waiting there. It's a bike cop. Puts on his lights, I'm thinking, yes, got him, right? The car pulls off, exits off the highway. I look for the cop to exit off the highway. Instead, the cop stays behind me, and I get pulled over instead, right? Have we failed to realize that we still have to obey God's law? Are we worshiping ourselves when we think, man, we're just going to take God's word and he's just going to cast judgment everywhere we go? All these people that need to repent. 
Hillary, Donald, America, uh, ISIS, the list goes on. My coworker, my dad, my mom, all these people, they need God. They need to repent. But are we using God to serve ourselves, hoping that God's judgment will come upon them, failing to realize that we are subject to God and his judgment and his wrath ourselves? Be careful that when we pray that God will judge the wicked, yes, he will. But be careful as we hope that God will judge the wicked, we not take God's patience, his grace upon us for granted. I think it's safe to say that we're not going to bow down to these bobbleheads anytime soon. Right? And don't worry, if you come and visit me in my office, I'm not going to be bowing down to these bobbleheads either. Right? But how often do we need to be careful of bowing down to the biggest bobbleheads that we know? Well, we don't bow down to statues made of plastic, made of whatever metal, made of stone. How often do we bow down to the very statues of flesh and blood, you and I? I'm not going to build a shrine like I see when I go to Taiwan, but I don't need to build a shrine inside my house. It's too late. My house itself is a shrine to me already. Be careful that we do not worship ourselves, even in the name of worshiping God. How? Be cautious. You may be worshiping yourself if you're worshiping God for your own gain. Instead of worshiping God for our own gain, be careful this way. Instead of marking the success of your relationship with God based on how much you gain in this world, mark the success of your relationship with God based on how much you're able to surrender of this world. Be careful, number two. A red alert that we're worshiping ourselves who we no longer think repentance replies or applies to us. Each and every month, we come to the Lord's table to observe Holy Communion. And this gives us a way to do just that. For us to remind ourselves that as we get busy with the things that we call doing church, as we get busy with all the things that we have going on this month and next month, that as we get busy with Thanksgiving dinner, whether it's on the 12th or 13th, I don't know anymore, whether it's getting busy with, with Angel Tree, whether it's getting busy with even congregational meetings, with baptism, with, with new member welcome whether it's getting busy with traveling and visiting friends and family, whether it's busy going Christmas caroling with having Christmas Eve service, all of these things that we do, we can lose sight of why we're doing it. All the things that we do can become idols to worship and to serve ourselves. And so it's just so important that we not only come once a month, but as often as we eat and we drink, we give remembrance to Jesus Christ. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gave this way for his disciples then and forevermore for us today to remember him. For us to remain grounded and anchored of what we do and why we do it and how we do it. Christ, he gave the bread representing his body, his sacrifice, and the cup the juice that we drink this morning is his blood that was shed for the forgiveness of sins. We can only know God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. His life, death, resurrection, and he's coming back one day. This morning, I invite you to come to the table. For those who have accepted Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, if you have repented of your sins and you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, you're welcome to take both elements back to your seat. And when the time is ready, we'll eat and drink together. As we take communion together, let's spend some time preparing our hearts and let's pray. First, remember. Remember what Christ did. Christ's life, death, and resurrection gives us a new life in him. 
reflect. Reflect on what Christ is currently doing in your life today. That he is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. That we have been given the Holy Spirit who lives and empowers us to do his will. Take a moment to reflect on your life. What are the things that we need to repent of? The ways that we turned against God. That if we're not careful, that we don't stop and take a moment to repent, we're just going to continue on a path, on a road of worshiping ourselves. What things do you need to repent of? The things that you need to surrender and to give to God. What are the things that you have made to serve yourself? What are the ways that you have expected God to serve you? And then lastly, we'll rejoice. We'll rejoice because we have the hope today and forevermore that our sins are washed away. And we have the hope that Jesus is coming back again. Let's take a moment to pray. And as you're ready, come forward, take both elements back to your seat. As we conclude our, our worship this morning, let us stand and sing our praises to God. And as we do so, let us reflect on those things. If there are things that in our life that we are worshiping ourselves, I mean, we take time to surrender those things. If we walk away this morning thinking, how have I gained? What have I gained? I hope that what we have gained is surrender to the Lord. I hope what we have gained is less of ourselves and more obedience to God. I hope that what we have gained is more clarity of how we are to honor and to glorify His name. So let's sing and to praise God this morning.